Okay, guys, so I hope everybody is uh, now familiar with um, how to do these Tika transformations and clustering. So the next step is naturally, so the, whole, this is the whole motivation for doing these things is, of course, that we want to estimate Markov state models. This is the reason why most people are here, I guess. So yeah, let's let's just walk through this notebook quickly. I I'll just give everybody a minute, maybe, to load it up. Is, is everybody on the in the process of opening this up? It should be the it's called MSN underscore estimation on the on the Dropbox uh, in day one still. So yeah, I'll just quickly repeat some of the things that we've done in the previous session. So all the uh, loading of the data, feturization, this is all going to be the first thing here. Um, and then we'll move on to the to the next session or the next part of the of the notebook. Uh, and we'll just check if the free energy landscape looks familiar from the other notebook. And um, okay, so one thing I will cover again here, maybe as we can see it as a bit of a follow-up to Guillermo's last session about the clustering is uh, is this uh, cluster, so the, the clustering and how it relates to the microstate model. So I'll just quickly walk you through the, the three different clustering methods that are here. Uh, sort of as a step-by-step -step, uh, process um, and then we'll see like how they compare if you didn't manage to do this yourself in the, in the previous session. Okay? So we will start with regular space clustering. It's very easily done with the cluster rec space, uh, space function and we will save the cluster centers <coughs> for visualization. You can just execute the cells as we go along. So so here yeah, I've illustrated the cluster centers with a very uh, small uh, distance between the cluster centers. So this is given by this d min. So this is the minimum distance that could be between two clusters in the transformed space. You can see there's a lot of clusters here. Uh, if we then move, move on to the next clustering techniques, then we will have, for instance, in k means, as you already tried, before, you'll be able to fill in your data, which is equal to y. I'm stuck with the German keyboard, so if I make any mistakes, blame the Germans. Mm -hmm. And we specify the number of cluster centers to be equal to 100. Okay. <coughs> And we see, again, a different clustering pattern as, as related to what Guillermo said before. Mm -hmm. They will focus on high density areas rather than uniformly trying to represent the entire density. So not, not regarding the density, but just regarding the difference in the transform <coughs> space. Okay? This is the big difference between these two. And then there's the probably least interesting of these clustering techniques. If, if you've already tried it out, you'll find out why. Uh, but I guess sometimes it can be useful, otherwise it wouldn't be here. Oh. So, here we say also how many centers we want to have, and we can also specify the stride and so forth. There's a bit more of a. Excuse yeah? me? I think that is help control. So, this is if you press, uh, I, I thought this was already covered, sorry. This is uh, you press, hold <coughs> sh shift. Shift? When you're inside the bracket of the function, uh, function, you press shift and then tap. If you press it the second time while holding shift, the whole entire doc string comes up. If you do it the third time, it, it, I think it m makes like a half a page where you can scroll through it more easily. Okay, This is very useful. This is the primary reason why I use Jupyter. 
uh, and the reason why you should do it too, I guess. Um, so if we, for instance, specify k to be equal to, let's say, 100 once more, just to keep everything uh, consistent, and we see, okay, uh, this clustering method runs along your time trajectory, and just every nth step, it puts in a cluster center. So if you have a situation where you spend a lot of time in the same area, and you randomly jump to an excited state, and you have very few cluster centers, there's a big <coughs> chance that you will not put a cluster center in the high uh, so the high energy uh, state, so the meter state of state. But we, we can see that we are lucky enough that we actually pick up these excited states, so these uh, low density areas, uh, with this set of parameters. But if we reduce the number of centers that we actually use, then we can probably easy, easily uh, capture a situation where we do not have this situation, so where we will not be able to represent the density. Oh, so even with 50, it's actually okay. Let's try to push it a bit. Okay, so if you only want 20 clusters, you can see you only represent these two minima over here, and we don't capture the rare event, uh, event at all. We want to avoid such situations when we build markup state models, because often the stuff that is going on over here is interesting, because this might be the dynamic event that we want to study. Uh, so this is why you always have to be a bit careful when you use do clustering to be inspect your results. Okay, so let's let's say uh, for now that the clustering technique that we are most interested in of these is the k-means. <coughs> we extract what we call this discretized trajectories from this. So this is basically where you take the oops, I didn't prepare. One. So the discretized trajectories is basically the time series and then how it moves around in this space up here. So in the case of k-means, you will <coughs> see a lot of jumping up and, up and down between these two states. And then you will at one point find a jump uh, to this excited state and then back again. This is what you saw in these time series plots <coughs> of your ticks. So what the class, when the, what the d trajectories are, so the discretized trajectories, is the assignment of your trajectory to a cluster at a certain time point. So basically, instead of having a XYZ coordinate of your atomic structure, you will get a state index. So one, two, three, four, five, as, as, as a function of time. So this will be a, a discrete representation of your time series, okay? Is everything clear? Okay, yes sir. Uh, so, in order to be able to do the estimation of Markov state models, we need to load in the, the library that takes care of this uh, estimation. And this is a sub-library of IEMA, which, is, which has a, uh, a backend, which is a backend, uh, and basically, in order to, to accurately estimate mo models, also models that are, that, are <coughs> that are good. So apart from the clustering, we need to look at, at two other things. So, uh, um, so clustering is one of the two things. The other thing is the choice of the lag time, which basically tells us when do we count transitions between the states. Because the Markov state model is basically a model that uh, uh, gives you the probability of jumping from one state to another state after a certain time at least in the case if you formulate it as a transition probability matrix. If you formulate it in terms of a rate matrix, it, it's in, in units of time, uh, of continuous time in principle. And, this, uh, and in the way that we will treat it today, it will only be discrete time. So we will have to, def we will have to ask uh, for a lag time here, and we will have to find a way to figure out this lag time. What is typically done is that we basically try out a lot of lag times, and we um, and we plot what is called implied time scales. So there will be more coverage of the details of this tomorrow morning. 
by Jan Hendrik, who uh, is here. Um, he will cover all the details of, of this and the theory behind this, but for now we will just take a look at what it looks like and how we practically implement this. Okay, so if you are interested in the exercises a bit later, we can uh, you can read these uh, brief explanations just to get some context for today. Okay, so after computing these implied timescales with this uh, its function on your detractors and you specify a number of lag times you want to use. Uh, there's a function in PyEmma to plot the implied timescales. So this is a plot that looks like this. If you ever seen a Markov data model paper, you've probably seen such a plot in it. And basically what it shows is each of the uh, relaxation timescales <coughs> or uh, implied timescales or whatever you want to call them. So uh, each of the processes of your Markov state model as a function of lag time. So the idea here is to observe that at a certain point there is no change in the time scale which is on the y-axis as a function of the lag time. And this is the kind of behavior we associate with being Markovian. So there's no, if you increase the lag time, there's no increase in the time scale. So this is the kind of behavior we want for a Markov state model. If we don't see this, we cannot assume that the model that we have actually is uh, will behave uh, according to what we expect. Okay. Um, yeah. So, of course, making this assessment of whether this is flat or not is a bit of uh, an eyeball balling exercise. Uh, and and another way you can do this is to estimate error bars of this using a Bayesian estimation. It takes a bit longer. But in this way, you get error bars. So you can see, is this slope, because you can see maybe this slight slope here, is this slope actually significant relative to, to the statistical data that we have available? Uh, and this is something we can do using the, by calling the same function, just specifying the errors to be base here. And then you can call it this with the same plotting function. And what you get out is, is a plot similar to this one. Just takes a bit longer because it has to posterior sampling. Okay. So while this is calculating, I can just point out another thing that is interesting to observe from, from this plot, at least how it is implemented in PyEmma. Uh, so there's this gray area here, and there's a black, like dense black line here. This is the time resolution cutoff. So everything that is below this line is processes that are faster than your lag time. So this is stuff that you cannot resolve with high confidence at least in your macro state model. So it would only make sense to analyze the processes that are above that line. Okay. So meanwhile, our error estimates have finished and we can see that there are relatively large errors on all of these uh, time scales, but we can see that it looks fairly flat compared to um, compared to the times uh, compared to the slope and the variations we see in the time scale. And we can see that at least three or four <coughs> of the slowest processes are converged in this case. Okay. And uh, based on this based on this plot, we wish to choose a lag time. So this is the next uh, step, is that, okay, using this plot, we can also say which is the lag time we need to use when we estimate our final Markov state model. And looking at this plot, it looks like the one microsecond uh, time point is a fairly good choice. It's a good compromise between not choosing a too long lag time that will dilute our statistics and a too short lag time that will risk uh, not being completely converged. So this is the trade-off you always have to make when you estimate Markov state models. So let's try to do that. That's uh, 100 steps, one microsecond. That's very quick. It's already done. And then we can check if all our MD data has been used in the estimation. And well, what do you know? It's all been used. And uh, all the states have been occupied. So this means that of all the cluster centers that we have generated originally, and all the data we have originally given to the estimation process, 
all of it has been used, and uh, uh, all the states have been uh, used as well. Okay. So one way of further validating this, so just because you choose uh, um, a lag time which looks like you have converged uh, time scales, doesn't necessarily mean that you have a self-consistent Markov state model. So one way of testing this is the Chapman and Kolmogorov test. Uh, <coughs> And there will also be more coverage about this tomorrow by Jan Hendricks of the details of this. Okay. So I will just briefly outline here how you do it practically. You can basically take the Markov state model <coughs> object which you've created here, which is this M. This was created up here in the function call. And there's a method on the Markov state model object called CK test. And here you have to specify a number. This is again something uh, which, sets, uh, which tells you how many sort of meter stable sets that you expect that you have, so free energy basins you expect to have in your set <coughs> that you want to do your test using. So this is also something we will cover a bit later, but for now we can just choose three as a number. And then we, we do the estimation. So this involves estimating a Markov state model for uh, integer, integer multiplum of the lag times that you already used. Uh, for a number of lag times, and then and then we can plot the results here, and then comparing it to the predict. So th basically, what is happening is that you have your Markov state model predicting what is going to happen with the population in the future, and then you're going to estimate this population directly from the data, and then you're going to compare the two results. Okay, so you can see here. What you want in, uh, to see in this plot is that the black and the blue lines are on top of each other or on top of each other within the experimental or, or the statistical noise that you have, okay? So you can see here that the clustering is not perfect. So uh, or there's something wrong here. There's uh, maybe the lag time is too short or the clustering is not good because you can see that a lot of these populations are not exactly on top of each other. Uh, another thing to take into account is, especially when you look at the the, the, the regular Markov state model, so the maximum likelihood version, is that you don't have error estimates. So you actually don't know whether this difference is significant or not. Okay, so one way we could, we could uh, do this is uh, one of the exercises that we will look at uh, now. Okay, so the exercises that you will have the next, I guess, 40 minutes to walk through is to play a bit around with the clustering methods again, get familiar with with how the, these different clustering methods affect the quality of the Markov state model, uh, try to choose the optimal lag time for different, uh, for the, uh, using the different clustering method, methods, and then see if you can get a, a Chapman Kolmogorov test that doesn't break down, or in which, ca in which case it breaks <coughs> down. And then you can try the same for the Bayesian Markov state model, um, documentation for this, so this Bayesian Markov state model you can find on the PyMR homepage. Uh, or I can also quickly. Oh, this is uh, this is too complicated for me. Okay. Um, <coughs> so you have to repeat this also for a Bayesian Markov state model. And then uh, the last exercise is doing a mock simulation, so simulating s a trajectory from your uh, MSN object. And there's also documentation on the PyMA homepage on, on how to achieve this, okay? So basically the idea is that once you have a Markov state model, you can simulate the long time scale behavior of the system just using the transition matrix, okay? So without it, uh, if, if there are no further questions, I will let you get to it. Okay, so let's try to summarize a bit for this session. I hope that everybody has been able to get something out of this uh, and uh, been able to try some of the exercises that I proposed that you, you take a look at. So I, there were not a lot of them because I guess there's a lot already from the previous session, a lot of new stuff, so I wanted you to, give, to get some uh, more time to get familiar with these things and so learn by doing. Uh, so the first question was uh, to look at 
master blocks with different lag times and with different uh, clustering methods, and then in investigate how the, the Chapman Kumokov test when it breaks down and when it sort of fulfills. And hopefully, what you've seen is that there's a lot of cases where it fails and a lot of cases where it works, right? So it means that basically there's a lot of good ways of making a Markov model and a lot of bad ways of doing it. And there's not always just one optimal solution to this problem. Okay, so just to give you an example here, is I, I now took the, the discrete trajectories from the regular space clustering that we did above here. So this, <coughs> this guy up here. And I did the implied time scale plots, and as you can see, it looks very similar to what we saw before. Converges to very similar time scales, uh, and you see like the same three lines here. So this is the the implied time scales of the Markov model. You see that these same three lines sort of pop out here as, as they did above. So the same three lines. This is for the different clustering, and they look very similar. Uh, and if we then choose, it, for instance, a different lag time to build a Markov plane model, we can now choose 80 steps, which is then 800 nanoseconds. And we do a Chapman Kumarov test. We see and in the plotting, we see that this is maybe slightly better than the other model. And then we can sort of iterate back and forth between different parameters and different clustering methods to sort of s see if we can get this to work, okay? Uh, one thing that I want to point out is that, that of course, this, uh, like the larger, <coughs> the larger you, ch you, you ch so I want to stress this point, the larger you, you, you choose your lag time for your Markov state model, the larger these lag times that it tests out here will also be, right? And the errors will become larger and larger. But you probably saw this with when you were inspecting the error bars with the Bayesian version of the Chapman Markov test. And then the final thing was sort of to generate a trajectory from your final Markov state model. So say that we have now generated a Markov state model. So the people who managed to, to make it here, they would have found out that there's a method in the Markov state model called generate tra trajectory. And what this does is basically uh, take a number of steps that you want to sample. So this is the number of, of times you want to, uh, so in units of lag time you want to you simulate. And then uh, if you want to start in a certain sta state or end in a certain state, and then a stride. And then it basically simulates the Markov state model as it would have been an empty trajectory and it outputs uh, a bit of a cryptic output, uh, and basically what this means is that this is the, uh, if you've inputted a single trajectory, this will always be zero. If you have multiple tra multiple trajectories, it will be the index of the trajectory in your input, and this will be the frame number, so the time step of the trajectory. Basically, it creates a new time series based upon all the old time series as possibilities. And then you can use uh, such input, for instance, with other functions in PyEmma to export PDB <coughs> files or DCD files that you could inspect in a uh, VMD or PyMol or Chimera or what you, whatever you want. So if there are no further questions, I will invite you all to have a quick coffee before Felix takes over and talks about the more advanced stuff uh, regarding to MSN estimation. Thank you. Let's move on to the last session for today. It's about a few more details about MSM estimation. The particular aspect we're going to look at now in the last uh, maybe half an hour is um, how to deal with the distribution sampled by the data and the impact that this distribution has on the final MSM estimate. So whenever we estimate a market stakeholder, we're the object of our interest is a transition matrix. There's a matrix called the T tau here, which contains for every pair of states, Si and Sj, these are your discrete states obtained by the k means clustering or any other method. And it, it contains the conditional probabilities to observe the process in, say, state Sj at 10 tau, given that it was in state 
SI at time zero. These conditional dumb probabilities are here. The quantities are pictures. What we do um, underneath to estimate these quantities is more or less a accounting scheme. Yeah? We are counting how many transitions from i to j have, have we observed in the data over a time window of length tau, and we divide it by the number of total visits to each state i, and this fraction should intuitively provide us with a good estimate of the conditional jump probability, right? We divide the number of transitions from i to j by the total number of visits to state i, this should at least intuitively provide a good estimator for this conditional jump probability. The situation we have in mind is usually that we are using many potentially short simulations, and then we estimate the, these um, quantities here over all of the simulations and hope that this sort of ensemble average provides a good estimate. But the problem is that this would, of course, work perfectly if there really were only these discrete states. But in fact, there is a continuous state space underneath, so the behavior of the, of the system can, can vary inside each of the states. And the probabilities to go to a certain state can vary inside each and every state. And, it can, and if, in fact, the, the question whether this estimator here is biased or not depends on the discretization and another, another of additional factors that we're going to look at. So let's go through different scenarios step by step. First of all, if all of the simulations we have used if their initial conditions were started from the global equilibrium distribution of the process, yeah, so the, the equilibrium distribution that's not changed by the dynamics, the consequence is that the, the ensemble of simulation will, simulations will remain in this distribution, so they will sample this distribution throughout the simulation time, and as a, as a result, the estimator I've shown you on the first slide is unbiased. Yeah? But asymptotically, the number of um, transitions between each pair of states, i and j, will equal the joint probability of observing the process, first in state i and then in state j, um, in equilibrium. And in the same way, the expected number of visits to, um, to the state i will be, um, is exactly equal to the stationary probability of the state i. And uh, yeah, we shouldn't take the um, shouldn't take the unnormalized counts here, but we should use normalized counts here in order to have these probabilities here. That means for simulations that were started from global equilibrium, the estimator is correct and unbiased. In many cases, however, it's not possible to produce simulations that sample from global equilibrium, either because the global equilibrium isn't really known, or because um, an, a different scenario would be that we start simulations from some completely um, un completely off equilibrium distribution, but we hope that it converges to the global equilibrium distribution, but our simulation time might simply be too short to ever reach this distribution. One more situation where the estimator is also unbiased is if we use a local equilibrium distribution to start the trajectories. Uh, so if mm, the relative fraction, I would say, of, number of the number of trajectories started in each state can be anything, but I inside, e in e inside of each state, the distribution of starting points is proportional to the global equilibrium distribution, then this estimator is still fine, at least if we, are, if we carry out one step. Yeah? So if we were using extremely short trajectories, but potentially many of them, and would only count one step of, le of length tau, then the counting estimator is, is again unbiased. Somehow, the reason is that mm, the different proportion of the trajectories started in each state cancels out if we divide these quantities by each other. Yeah, it doesn't matter for the ratio of these quantities. But it already, the situation already changes if we do not use only one single step, but multiple steps. The reason for this is that lo the local equilibrium that we might have used in the first step is not restored after one step. Yeah. This can be seen in this model example here. So again, that's the dynamics in this <coughs> particular two-state landscape here. And we are starting from, a, from an initial distribution, which is concentrated entirely in the left half um, of the, of the x-axis here. 
And then we let the dynamics evolve. Here we look at the distribution in continuous space after a certain number of steps, 250, the number is not really important. And here again, we look at the distribution in continuous space after 500 steps. And as expected, the distribution sort of smears out and slowly probability is transferred into the right half of the state space. Now after, mm, after zero steps, oh wait, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to say is here we see the exact distribution in, sta in continuous state space. Here we look at local equilibrium distributions in each of the two states. Yeah? So we have these two macro states consisting of the left and the right half of the plane. And of what we are drawing here are the local equilibrium distributions in each of these states. <coughs> this is the distribution that we would somehow inherently assume if we estimate a Markov model using multiple steps. Yeah? We would assume that in each step the, the real continuous distribution has relaxed at least locally into this local equilibrium distribution. But, at, but in many cases this may not be true. Yeah? So the general conclusion we can draw is whenever we, we can assume that after each step this, the distribution within each, each state has <coughs> relaxed to a local equilibrium, then our standard estimator will still be at least approximately unbiased. Otherwise, we don't know. Yeah? So the general situation is we don't know if the estimator is unbiased or not. Please uh, interrupt me if you have any questions, OK? Oops, something is missing here. Ah, no. Mm. I wanted to briefly illustrate that this can indeed be a problem. So if we use another toy example, again, particle diffusing around in this two-well landscape here, and we use a, an admittedly poor discretization into these two states. And it uh, accounts, it, or it includes a lot, of this, uh, a lot of this transition region into the second state. This is not a very smart discretization. Mm. Now we use very short trajectories, started mostly from the first state, estimate a Markov model at, at several small lag times, and we, and we look at the probability estimated for the first state. Yeah, so we estimate the Markov model, we extract the estimated probability, stationary pro probability of the left state, and we monitor, monitor it here as a function of the lag time. The different curves correspond to different simulation lengths. You will see them in the next picture. These are the shortest ones, and then the trajectories become longer and longer. And we see that, for the, at least for the very short simulations, the estimates are really bad. Yeah, the, the difference to the reference, which is the black line underneath here, this probability is very low, is very large. Yeah? So this really this can be a problem. Mm. Yeah, this can be a problem in practical situations. What we can do next is we can analyze this error. Yeah? We can analyze the error between the true equilibrium transition matrix and the standard estimator, or at least the expectation value of this standard estimator, which simply divides the counts by each other. And we can write on an expression for that and split it up into various parts. The expression is given here on the left hand on the right hand side. And it's basically a superposition of several projections of our discretizations onto leading eigenfunctions weighted by leading eigenvalues of the process. So we are here we are summing over all of the spectral components of the underlying propagator, you know, the one we have also already encountered in the talk earlier today about Tika. We assume that there are only finitely many of these spectral components. We assume that there are only, let's say, capital M of these dynamical processes here. The lambda m's are the eigenvalues at the left time tau, and the psi <coughs> m's are again the true eigenfunctions. So the expression is somehow composed of a superposition of projections of the states. These chi's here um, are just the indicator functions of the sets onto the spec dominant spectral component of the process. And here we have projections that are weighted by the equilibrium distribution, chi, whereas here we have projections that are weighted by the empirical distribution sampled by the process. Yeah. If the process is not started 
from a global equilibrium, but from some other distribution. This could be a local equilibrium, equilibrium. this could be some completely, completely different distribution, then there will be an empirical distribution sampled by the process. It's not really important to know for us right now how it looks like, but there will be one. And the, these projections here are just created by this distribution. And what we can make out by, um, by looking at this in more detail is we, we can basically recognize three, I would say, well-known um, insights about MSM constructions that are mirrored in this expression. First of all, if we use, distribu if we use uh, sampling that was indeed sampling from the global equilibrium distribution, then <coughs> the empirical distribution equals the global equilibrium distribution and the error is zero. In the same way, if our trajectories are very, very long to reach the global equilibrium, the same effect happens, and the error is also zero. Next, if we increase the lag time, if tau is very, very large, then all these dynamical eigenvalues here have basically decayed to zero, and the error is also zero. So we can cure the error by increasing the lag time. And lastly, if these eigenfunctions here, these psi m's, are almost or entirely constant on along all of the sets, <coughs> all of our states that we have used, then just a number drops out of both of these scalar products here, and the difference here also vanishes. This reflects another well-known insight in MSM construction, that if your discretization is very, very good, such that the process is almost exactly Markovian on the discretiza discretization, then the estimation error is also zero. All of these three facts were basically known beforehand, but we see them reflected in this error analysis here. Yes, please. Uh, can you repeat again why if you increase the lag time, uh, the error is already used? Because these eigenvalues here, <coughs> these lumbering of tau, mm -hmm. they decay exponentially with the lag time. Oh. If, if tau is very, very large, then all of them have gone. All right. Good, but there may be practical situations where none of these criteria can be satisfied. Yeah? In very few practical examples, is it possible to sample from global equilibrium? That's usually impossible. And it's also not practical to extend the lag time to any arbitrary amount. Yeah? It's the, the amount to which we can extend the lag time is simply limited by the length of our simulations. If they're not long enough to have uh, relaxed, such that all of these processes are zero, then we cannot do it. Yeah? So there always remains a finite component. And lastly, the discretization component comes in. Yeah? And this, is a, this may be very difficult to adjust. Yeah? We do not, in advance, we do not know how to select the states such that all of the states are perfectly Markovian. Here's the full example again where we can illustrate all of these, um, all of these influences on the estimation error. We have the same discretization that I've already shown you in the previous slide. It's a better discretization, and we note immediately that for the better discretization, the bias is much, much smaller. We also see that it, the estimation bias decays with the lag time, and that it decays with the number of simulations. Yeah? Now the, the time scale of the slowest transition over here was on the order of more or less 3,000 to 4,000 steps, so that we, we see that for too short simulations, the error is really drastic, whereas for long enough simulations, the error is very small. Yes, please. Uh, what is the, the dashed line there? Uh, the dashed line on underneath, that's the reference. Yeah? So it's the, um, the true stationary probability of this state, all of this state. So we just I just picked okay, okay. I just I picked this number as a, as a as a quantity to compare, yeah? okay. and this is the true reference, and these are the estimates from the different models. Okay, so we we see um, yeah we have analyzed the error, and now of course the question what can we do in practice, and there it turns out there is a way to to correct uh, this bias. It's based on so-called observable operator models and their description of stochastic dynamics. I don't want to go into all of the details, but the main point is if we can assume, as we already did, that there are only 
there's only a finite number of dynamical processes, of these relaxation processes. So only a finite number of eigenvalues and corresponding eigenfunctions that play a role for the dynamics. Uh, it is possible to derive a model that can completely describe the stochastic dynamics in the sense that properties like this here, these are probabilities of making a sequence of observations. Yeah? We are asking what is the <coughs> probability to observe the process within a certain set, I've just called it A1, this is just a, set, a subset of the state space, at time instance tau, and then I pick another set, A2, and I ask the question, what's the probability to observe the process in A2 at time instance 2 tau, and so on and so forth, until AL and time instance L tau. Uh, ask, we ask the question, what is the probability to make this sequence of obs observations for any length L and for any selection of these sets AL? <coughs> Knowing all of these probabilities, is basically having complete knowledge of the, of the dynamics. Yeah? And expressions like these can be written down uh, or can be expressed by uh, I would call it a finite dimensional algebraic system. Yeah? It can be written as a long matrix vector product, which involves these matrices here, these xi, a, i. These matrices are the central object of this OOM theory. These matrices are capital N by capital N, so they have the dimension of the number of slow processes. That's what we assume. There is only a uh, finite number of slow processes. And wh what they contain as entries are um, basically overlaps between the eigenfunctions, but restricted to a set. Yeah, so we're taking overlaps of these different eigenfunctions, but restrict them to a set. If you work out the mm, expression for such an observation probability, based on integrals and integrating the transition kernel many times, and then inserting the fact that there are only a finite, there's only a finite number of processes, you arrive at this expression. Yeah. But what it means is, if we had some way of extracting these matrices here, these, we will call them set observable operators, then we could characterize the process. And in particular, we would be able to estimate a Markov model, because a Markov model needs two ingredients. It needs, it needs the, um, the joint probabilities of observing the process in set i and j at two different times, and the stationary probabilities pi i. And all of them are just special cases of this path probability formula here, using two time instances for this expression and just one for the stationary probabilities. So if we had some way of estimating these matrices here, we would be able to correct the Markov state model. And it is indeed possible to extract these um, to extract these, these set observable operators, even from non-equilibrium sampling, so from sampling that has not sampled the global or any local equilibrium distributions. And it needs two basic ingredients. The first is again just the count matrix, just the way we had it before. Yeah, we run over all simulation data and count how many times we have tr transitioned between set i and set j. And we need a sort of a two-step count matrix. Yeah? So for each set R, we count how many times did we visit set I in the first step, set J in at time step k plus two tau, and set R at the intermediate time step. Yeah? We ask for for the number of triples I R J for each possible R. Yeah? This is the this will be the additional information we need to extract the set observable operators. Uh, for the standard mark model, we have only used these one-step comp matrices. And the key insight was that these two-step count matrices with intermediate index R contain the set observable operators. Yeah? You can work out in theory what is what the expected value of C2 tau R is, so the matrix based on the intermediate set at in set R. And it's a lot of, it contains a number of projection matrices that we cannot really compute, but somewhere in the middle of this decomposition, the set observable operators do appear. And now the question only remains if we can extract them somehow. And it's indeed possible, 
by some transformations, some linear algebra transformations. In the first step, we use the normal, the standard count matrix, and use a compact singular value decomposition to extract the rank. Yeah? In a singular value decomposition, is a tool that allows you to do many things, but among others, it allows you to extract the rank of a matrix, the matrix rank. We do this. We only store, um, at least with the significant singular values and singular vectors, do some transformations, some scaling. And the, and the important point is, if we use these transformation matrices and apply them to the, the two-step matrix, we, apply some we um, obtain something which is similar to the set observable operator. Yeah, the set observable operator is still in here. It gets multiplied by two matrices. We don't even know what these R matrices are, but it's not important because <coughs> in this formula here, all the R factors vanish. Yeah, they just cancel out. So we found <coughs> that we obtained this expression. So let me repeat what we need to do. We need to estimate the standard count matrix just as before. We decompose it by singular value decomposition and perform these transformations here. We also estimate these two-step count matrices for, every, for each and every of our states, R. And then we transform it to obtain the set observable operators. Using the set observable operators, we can calculate equilibrium C tau, equilibrium <laughs> stationary, pro stationary probabilities, and in the end, we have a Markov model and we can proceed <coughs> just as before. Let me show you an example which, which tells us that this is really helpful and meaningful. We studied one of our usual toy systems, LN and dipeptide, so a very small molecule. And we, um, we produced a simulation data set which, is con which um, contains many very short simulations, only 20 picoseconds in length, but many of them, 11,000 roughly. And this was designed in such a way that the empirical distribution sampled by the process is really non-equilibrium. Yeah? What you see here is the standard equilibrium distribution of the process that you would obtain from long sampling. It's very well known. And here, at a comparison, we have the empirical distribution. And we see that it's really significantly different. Yeah? There's not even a, lo uh, a local equilibrium reach within, within each of these three metastable states that are well known for the system. And I just would like to draw your attention to this plot over here. Again, we compare the estimate for stationary probability. This time, we look at the stationary probability of all of the states concentrated in this right half of the plane. You see the discretization we've used here was generated by k-means clustering of this data set. We've used a lot of k-means centers, 40, I think. So this is a good discretization. Yeah? It's really no problem of the discretization. But we use strongly off equilibrium sampling, short simulations, and short lag times. And we see that the estimate obtained from a standard Markov model here in green is really way off from the, from the reference, from the reference stationary probability of the right hand side. On the other hand, if we use the OOM correction and analyze the Markov model obtained in this way, we obtain a correct estimate already at fairly short lag times. Yeah? This lag time is around half a picosecond, so that's really a short lag time, even for this system. All right, this is available in Payama now, uh, within the standard estimator function, estimate Markov model. It's just one keyword, it's called weights. And if you supply the option empirical, that's the default, then you will use the default estimator that we had in the beginning. And if you use the keyword OOM, then we will use the OOM theory to obtain a corrected Markov model. If you want to read about the if you want to read the details and check it out, we all, all of it in detail. I can refer you to this publication. It's in press at the moment, but it's also available on archive. I would like to say one more thing. Mm -hmm. This is fairly new, so I guess there's still a lot to explore and a lot to find out. We are very happy to receive your feedback on this, <coughs> whatever sort of problems or um, yeah, other things that are good to know you find out, just let us know. Mm. 
I would also expect that, it, that for a, at least for a large number of states, this can take significantly longer than standard MSM estimation, because under yeah underneath you have to you also need to perform a bootstrapping. One of the critical steps here is the rank selection. Yeah, when you remember that we were doing this SVD here, and this SVD must be truncated at some point, and it's not really clear if. Uh, if an SVD cutoff of 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 4 is better. What we decided to do instead was first extract a, mm, a sort of reduced count matrix such that all counts can be assumed to be more or less independent. And then we resample the count matrices based on the, this distribution that arises to perform bootstrapping. Then we decompose these count matrices again and again and again. And form a statistical analysis of the singular values. We only keep those that seem to be statistically reliable. This is how we extract the rank in practice. This can take a lot of time, especially if you have a lot, use a lot of states, so we would also be very um, happy to receive your feedback on, on your experiences with this method. That's all. Thank you for your attention.